Hello everybody and welcome to a complete guide to the CIA or the Central Intelligence Agency. Now before we get into this video, I have some announcements to make. So all money made from this video is going to go to the Gaza Emergency Fund. As well, 30% of all the funds from my book that are as linked in the description, 30% is going to go to the Gaza Emergency Fund as well. Alright, we got this out of the way. Let's get right into the video. So let's talk about Operation Paperclip. So Operation Paperclip was the space race, but for Nazis. So after the war, you know, you heard about the Nuremberg trials. They tried lots of Nazis for the crimes against humanity, their massacres and genocide against the Jews. But some Nazis were kept. They were exempted from the Nuremberg trials. And they went and worked for the USA. They worked for NASA. They worked all over the CIA the OSS, and lots of these very important members of the US government forces were ex-Nazi members that they grabbed. And there was also a conjoint operation called Operation Bloodstone, where they stole the Nazis who escaped to the Soviet Union to work for them and then brought them back to the US to work for the US. So the goal was to grab as many Nazi scientists as possible because they were the smartest, they were the most advanced people. And also the reason why they were able to fight, fight off like almost the entire world, right? Because they had the smartest, the, the most uh, technologically advanced uh, materials and research. And they really had a lot of money to research and to learn a lot of things. And the US wanted to grab these people. And a lot of these people had very shady backgrounds and were involved in many sorts of genocide. And I'll talk to you about these types of people. So I'll tell you about someone called Werner von Braun. So he was a rocket scientist for Nazi Germany, and he was part of the V-2 rocket program. The V-2 rockets were an extremely powerful rocket. It could fly from all the way from Germany and at a speed of 4,000 kilometers per hour, slash and exploded civilians in London. So this was an extremely deadly rocket, and they got slaves from the Mitteldorf concentration camp to build these rockets for them. When the US arrived to this camp, they saw tons of corpses. So this guy, he's not just a rocket scientist, he's responsible for the deaths of these workers he knew that were, that were working to death to build these rockets, and he's also responsible for the launching of these rockets, who killed thousands of people and civilians. Now what happened to Werner Van Braun? Well, they sent him all the way to the down south, to Texas. And what did he do in Texas? Well, he became director of NASA in 1960. And he hasn't really received that much punishment and received a lot of money from the US, even though he was a Nazi and done very terrible stuff. Now, this was not the only person we can talk about. We can talk about the SS Brigadefuhrer Walter Schieber. So, this guy, he worked alongside the Minister of War, Albert Speer. And he was part of the Chemical and Warfare Division. He developed a sort of weapon called a Dabin and Sarin gas, and these things, these gases, were extremely deadly during the war. And he did many experiments on concentration camps worker. For example, he blended clothing and he made 150 prisoners eat them, which 110 of them died. He was also at Nuremberg in 1945, and he was exempted and brought to the United States Chemical Corps and then worked for the CIA. Yeah, the own government was the Nazis. Well, not exactly, but he was a Nazi who started working for the US government, which is kind of insane if you think about it. I talk about also some, some, someone called the Kurt Blum. So this guy, well, in the beginning you'd be like, oh, okay, no, he's a pretty okay guy, but he was a cancer researcher. What he did, he's, he injected prisoners with cancer. Now, he wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to discover the cells. No, he injected cancers into prisoners. He developed also biological weapons that he would have used against the US if the Germany had the chance. And he developed a weapon where he put mosquitoes and he injected them with malaria and it could be used as a biological weapon. Which, by the way, the United States also, well, probably because of this guy, also developed... Uh, something called Operation Bellwether, which is also an operation by the CIA to use malaria and put them in mosquitoes and just use mosquitoes as a biological weapon. 
Uh, so yeah, this guy, he admitted to, you know, cruelly brutalizing patients, and then he was recruited to the U.S. Army Chemical Corps. So he was part of the United States Army. Uh, we have, we have other, other people. The, the last guy, I promise, for us is, is going to get too much. Someone called Dr. Friedrich Hoffmann. He was responsible for the murder of 145 Czechoslovak priests. And what he did is he tortured them and he murdered them. And you know what? He was put in the United States Army Chemical Corps because he managed to inject malaria into these priests. And that was a good biological weapon. So they were like, oh, you know, we want to learn the same thing. And put this guy in the United States Army Chemical Corps. Whew. Okay, well, let's get to our next topic, which is the topic of Klaus Barbie. Now, Klaus Barbie, he was a member of the SS and also a member of the Gestapo, and he was stationed in France. Now, this guy, he was helped by the CIC to escape the Nuremberg trials. So, who was this guy? He was the head of Hotel Terminus, a camp for the Gestapo. He ran Hotel Terminus with the objective of torturing French people who wanted to uh, escape France, who was against the Nazis in France. And he tortured them and brutalized them. One example is the example of Jean Moulin. He was a hero and he wanted France to be free from Nazis. And when he was sent to Hotel Terminus, he broke his back and his ribs, which killed him instantly. He also brutalized women and children in his hotel, and he also grabbed Jews from the street and would beat them and kill them in his hotel. And this guy, this cruel man, was brought by the US, and the US helped him escape all the way to Bolivia. And French authorities were searching for him for over 40, 50 years. They finally found this guy in 1972. And in 1972, they discovered that this guy didn't escape on his own. He was helped by the United States. This Nazi was helped by the United States to escape French prosecution. Now, now he was, uh, uh, in 1972, he was placed in a prison, in a, in a French prison for life. And then the US apologized for helping him. But, you know, if they weren't discovered, they would have never told the world that they helped this terrible human being escape all the way to Bolivia from prosecution. But for the Soviet Union, there was many spying operations by the United States and the CIA. You can think about the U-2 spy planes, planes over the Soviet Union where they spied. Uh, you can think about Operation HP Lingual, where males from the Soviet Union would open first in some sort of like black operation where they would open the mail from the Soviet Union, read it first, and then give it to the citizens of the US. So, you know, well, it's not that disturbing. And of course, the, the obvious... Uh, project Acoustic Kitty, where they brought this robot kitty in the Soviet Union and tried to get it to spy the Soviet Union. But then the robot kitty got hit by a car and it was over. So this, I haven't done too much research. It's not really too disturbing, uh, but you can feel free to search it up. Uh, it's very fun. It's like CIA fun facts, but um, it doesn't play that much. In my, in my, in my opinion, it doesn't play that much in the... Uh, in the context of you know uh, truly disturbing things the CIA has done because they've obviously done worse things than open mail or to send a cat in, in the Soviet Union as a spy. So how do we even start? Well, Operation Gladio was the CIA's stay behind army. They were scared that the Soviet Union would invade Europe so they were hide weapons over there in Europe, and these far-right groups that they would pay would use these weapons and try to overthrow leftists, they would try to like change elections, they would change the entire geopolitics of Europe. Well, let's just get into an example because just like this is very hard to understand. So let's get right into the Italy, and in Italy, the Gladio network was quite disturbing. So one of the things they've done is that in 1972, they installed a car bomb. They hired a far-right terrorist to place a car bomb, which killed the three cabinieri, which were the special police over there. And then they blamed it on the left-wing terror groups. Now in Turkey, 
this took a different form. It was called the Counter Guerrilla. So they were responsible for a rogue CIA funded army that were responsible of the 1977 Taskim Square Massacre. So in 1977, there was a protest by left wing students who was against all the things happening that they were mysteriously gunned down by hidden snipers in buildings. Now we never discovered who these snipers were, but we highly suspected that they were hired by the CIA and that they were part of the Gladio network. Uh, of which Turkey confirmed that Gladio was present in Turkey. So it is possible that this massacre is linked directly to the Gladio network. Now for Spain, apparently there was no secret branch. Gladio was the government. Well, Spain was still fascist. So placing Gladio, who was very right-wing fascist, well, it fit completely with the government at that time. Now for Portugal, it took the form of the Anginter Press. They were a black ops assassination group. And they participated, apparently, in many assassinations in the Portuguese colonies. They participated, for example, in 1968-1978, Guatemalan terror, and participated in Guatemalan terror operations alongside the CIA and the Green Berets, and the overthrow of Salvador Allende in 1973. So this is the documents that I've read. Uh, but again, this is Daniel Ganser, which is, he pushes a lot of his commentary, so we're not too sure, but it is possible that uh, they've participated in massacres overseas in Port. Now we have Greece, which took the form of the Hellenic Greek Mountain Brigade, also called the Hellenic Raiding Forces. So apparently they were responsible for a Greek military coup d'etat in 1967, uh, allegedly because the Prime Minister was against U.S. occupation, was against uh, U.S. presence in Greece, and was against U.S. presence in NATO, and were the high preponderance of U.S. presence in NATO. And he was very anti-U.S. influence, and that's why, allegedly, that he was overthrown by the Gladio network, which took form of the Greek Mountain Brigade, and then took over his entire regime, and, you know, overthrew his government. Now, we're not sure exactly if it's possible. Uh, again, the leads are quite dry, but we do know that Gladio was in Greece. Now, in France, this is very push, but in France, there was a secret organization called L'Organisation de l'Armée Secrète, which was a far-right terrorist group who participated in bombings in France. They threw a grenade in a cafe. They entered, you know, train stations, fired at people. Uh, they murdered a lot of people. And apparently, well, Daniel Ganser is saying that Gladio was also part of this far-right terrorist group. And they said some of the members, or some of the members received weapons from the CIA to perform these attacks. Uh, but again, this is still very dry. I have to mention it. Uh, Germany, for Germany, uh, well, it's not that clear, but apparently one of the neo-Nazi groups received weapons from the CIA, they were called the Vest of Gurchen Gruppes Hoffmann, and in September 26, 1980, at the Munich festival, they performed a terrorist attack, who caused the deaths of over 213 people, and apparently they received guns from an underground forest cache, part of Operation Gladio and part of the CIA. Now this rogue kind of uh, funding is still unclear if they're really, really responsible uh, or were they acting independently from the CIA. But there's still these accusations placed upon the CIA. Uh, for Austria, well for Austria it's a little bit more complex. They have been more secretive. They haven't done that many investigations into this Gladio network. But they had said that they have no links with Gladio, but we found many weapon cache uh, in Austria, which is very concurrent with all the weapons that we found in Europe. And, you know, well, they probably have some sort of things that happened within Austria, but they don't want to tell us. So we don't, we, we, we don't know. Uh, for Switzerland, we have something called the Swiss Secret Military Service, the P26. And apparently they discovered something about Gladio, but they quickly hid it. And then now we don't know what happened with Gladio in Switzerland. Uh, Belgium, there are some accusations that the CIA was responsible in the Gladio network of the Brabant massacre. So this was an incident where men in hoods went into grocery stores and started shooting at people. And one guy grabbed a shotgun in the supermarket and fired at a family and killed all three of the family members. Uh, this caused over 28 dead and over 50 injuries and apparently after this these far-right groups were well 
at the end we didn't know who did that so some people have some suppositions that this might be again uh part of the gladio network but again we're really not sure but it's still an accusation that was placed on the gladio network and yeah so this is also all, all of these is getting really, really pushy so we don't know for sure exactly if the CIA was responsible for that uh, we also have in the Netherlands it was called branch O and apparently the Gladio network well which is the, these rogue military troops they went all the way to Indonesia to fought to fight the independence movement in 1948 uh, in Luxembourg Apparently they said that there was no Gladio and we, gotta, we don't know anything. In Denmark it was called the Project Absalon and they were a little bit less uh, aggressive. They just formed a brigade that was ready to fight against the Soviet Union in case of an attack. And Absalon was actually a medieval Danish bishop group who protected, who had defeated actually the Russians in the Middle Ages. So they formed this new group. Uh, and during the Cold War that would be ready to fight the Russians in case of an invasion. Uh, Norway, uh, well, apparently the Gladio was over there, but Norway was very against American intervention. Uh, so they arrested a like, Gladio agent inside of Norway. And uh, yeah, so Norway, we're not sure, but we know that there was Gladio networks, but they were very anti-US influence in Norway, which kind of stopped this uh, this. Uh, Gladio things to really grasp the government. For Sweden, allegedly there was the assassination of the Swedish Prime Minister Olad Palme, but this still remains unproven. And lastly, we have Finland. So Finland, after the Cold War, well, during the Cold War, was placed in a very tedious situation. It was between the Soviet Union and NATO, right? So they were very the Gladio wasn't really able to impose itself as much because Finland didn't want too much of like NATO influence because they were scared that the Soviet Union would get angry and invade them. So uh, yeah, so apparently there was a small Gladio cell and they just placed C4 near the Russo-Finnish border. And that's all. They didn't do more than that, apparently. Whew, okay, well we covered all of that. Uh, let's look at black sites. Uh, this is the last topic. Black sites are torture sites all across Europe where they would extradite uh, people that they believe are... Well, this is after 9-11. This is, this is way after World War II. But they would expedite people who they believe are terrorists and they would torture them. And there were many incidents of people who were innocent and who were sent to the black sites for torture anyways. And then they were released. And then, you know, uh, well, we discovered that they were you know, sent, sent in like a sent into a black site. So I'll put a map of all the black sites we know in Europe uh, and also you, you'll see some in Africa on the map as well. Uh, so yeah, this is also, uh, I, I think a lot of these still exist and are still hosted. So that was a little bit of a guide of the CIA in Europe. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. And um, if I missed anything, I probably missed a lot of stuff. Leave it in the comments and I'll make another video. And thank you for watching this video and I'll see you in the next video.